Imagine someone pushing through the crowd at the ancient Athenian marketplace, holding up a lantern and saying, I'm looking for an honest man. I'm looking for an honest man. That's one of the charming stories that we get about Diogenes of Sinope, the ancient Cynic philosopher. And Cynicism is a school that we don't hear a lot about, aside from, perhaps, it's from the ancient Greek word kion, which means dog. And so kinikos means dog-like. And so the Cynics were the dog-like philosophers, those that were closer to and perhaps lived like animals. And that's exactly the story that we get with Diogenes of Sinope, who was famous for living in a jar in Athens. And so no house, nothing other than, you know, this presumably discarded clay pot to keep him from the elements. And so he lived without, obviously, any material possessions. This is a rather ascetic life, and this is one where he was famous for thumbing his nose at ancient Athenian society. And so it's a very countercultural approach to philosophy, one which says no to culture and doesn't just turn its back on it. Socrates, arguably, to some extent, turned his back on Athenian culture. Not really. He didn't write anything. He didn't charge for his services. He wandered the marketplace and talked with people and frequently showed that they didn't really know what they thought they knew, and so it was kind of embarrassing and frustrating to them. But Diogenes and the Cynics were much more aggressively countercultural. They were much more ostentatiously countercultural, and they were famous for the way that they lived and their ascetic life, which emphasized self-sufficiency, a rejection of material culture, and indeed any given cultural standard for behavior including the acceptance of women into their ranks. And so there was, there was nothing with respect, essentially, to the ancient Athenian culture that Diogenes and the other cynics preserved. And indeed, one of the stories that we get is that Alexander the Great came to visit Diogenes in his pot one day on the streets of Athens and said, essentially, you know, look, I very much respect you. You know, I, have, I hold you in high esteem. Is there anything that I can do for you as the emperor? And Diogenes responded, you can stand out of my sunlight. <laughs> You're blocking the sun, you know. And uh, Alexander was apparently very impressed with this and said, if I was not Alexander, I would want to be Diogenes. And so this is, I think, this serves a number of different purposes, right? It highlights the countercultural aspect of ancient cynicism, but it also shows that they were held in very high regard up to and including the emperor, Alexander, who was the, you know, kind of emperor of all emperors in ancient Greece. And so this was not a, you know, school that people necessarily made fun of and just entirely discarded. On the contrary, it was one that we must understand in its historical context, which is why? Why did it arise when it did? Why is it that people were thinking to do this? It's easy for us today to skip that question because the idea of rejecting culture and saying, you know, I'm going to be my own person and forget what it is that the cultural standards have to offer, you know, inside these walls, I'm going to do as I please. Well, that's not something that is forever and always in human history. It's not a given that everybody is just always going to be inclined to the kind of individualism that we are today. And so, this stands out as something unusual and extraordinary when it occurs in ancient Greece. And so one of the things that we can do is we can look to someone like Antisthenes, who was the founder of cynicism. He was a contemporary of Socrates. And Socrates, if you recall, was someone who wandered the streets of Athens in the marketplace, encountering people, putting them in philosophical conversation, oftentimes showing them they didn't really know what they thought they knew, and so it was uncomfortable in a way that didn't entirely accord with the way that everyone else thought, including what ultimately happened to Socrates, where he was more or less rejected from the culture, corrupting the youth, where corruption, of course, should be understood in terms of not being in line with cultural values. And so, indeed, this includes religion. Now, Socrates was not explicitly opposed to ancient Athenian religion, but he suggested a number of modifications to it, of course, as a lot of other philosophers did around that time, including some of his predecessors, that we should modify things somewhat, make the gods less immoral, and make them something, you know, to look up to in a slightly different way. That's an, that's an indication that religion was changing around this time. And cynicism is also, I think, something that we should understand in this light. And so, whereas 
From Socrates, Plato broke off in one direction and ended up founding a school, having a following, doing a lot of writing, and then having, of course, an extraordinary influence basically for the last, I mean, almost 2,500 years. The Cynics, however, continued the remainder of Socrates' legacy. They took the portion of Socrates' legacy where he was a vagrant wandering the streets of Athens who was encountering people in conversation and sought purity in philosophy, in pure philosophical conversation, insight, virtue, improvement of the self outside of any kind of material consideration, outside of any particular cultural bias or value. Do away with all that stuff. Let's just focus on what matters and virtue for the individual person, goodness for the individual. That's the legacy that the cynics caught on to. They were simply more aggressive in saying no to Athenian culture. And so this is something that lives on, not just, you know, cynicism wasn't just a flash in the pan that disappeared after Antisthenes. It was something that lived on, especially in Stoic philosophy. And so if we want excellent examples of ancient cynics, one of the places that we can look, because we we don't have writings for them, is to the ancient Stoics. And so Epictetus' Enchiridion, for instance, and we'll discuss that in length, that was a good example of cynic thought to a large extent. And so Stoicism is, to a large extent, an inheritor of the Cynic tradition, tracing back to the side of Socrates that was not embraced by Plato. Well, now all of a sudden, I hope you can see that this is where a big bifurcation happens. And so beginning with Socrates, we have the more academic side. Plato's school was called the Academy. And so the more settled side that actually did do philosophical writing, even if it was in dialogue form, so not a terrific departure from conversation, but by the time we get to the next generation with Aristotle, we do have a significant departure from conversation because he's writing in treatises. And so within only a couple of generations from Socrates, going through Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, we have people writing in treatises much like we do now in the modern academy. We still call it the academy. On the other side of that is the wandering the streets of Athens, saying no to Athenian culture, refusing to write anything, and eschewing all material wealth. That is the side of Socrates that doesn't get emphasized as much in Plato, but does get emphasized in Stoicism. And so it's interesting, and sometimes when people encounter Stoicism for the first time, it seems strange that the Stoics hold Socrates as a kind of paragon of Stoic virtue. But I think it's a little bit less strange if we consider that the Stoics can trace their lineage through the Cynics to Socrates himself. So with that background in mind, I hope Stoic philosophy and indeed what happened after Socrates and why it is that Plato didn't pick up everything from his teacher, I hope that'll make a little bit more sense.